Hello, and welcome back to part seven of a 10-part series, GNAT TV and other community access centers across the Vermont Access Network are hosting in partnership with the Vermont Council on Rural Development, the Barry Times Argus, and Rutland Herald newspapers. I'm Andrew McKeever, the news director at GNAT TV's news project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today. This 10-part series is about the ideas for the future of Vermont and looks at what are some of the big questions that are facing the state as we emerge out of the pandemic and into whatever lies ahead. What are some of the big issues facing the state in the coming years, and how will we go about tackling them? Upcoming topics in our series will include such areas as regional coordination, investing in the working landscape, and civic engagement. So far, some of the topics we've discussed include broadband development, welcoming new Vermonters, climate change and its relationship to the state's economy, economic disparities within the state, and localizing food and energy. If you've missed one of them, or want to get caught up on some of the previous discussions we've had, you can visit the website futureofvermont.org backslash explore, and you can find not only the previous telecasts, but also the written opinion pieces that have been published in the Herald and the Times Argus, and also the podcast versions of uh, some of our shows in case you'd just rather listen. Today, our topic is about building business and economic vitality in the state. Specifically, the seventh proposition reads, Vermont must strengthen business vitality by advancing entrepreneurship, investment, workforce, and rural innovation. With us today to discuss this point are John Copans, who's the program, program director of the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Monique Priestley is the founder and executive director of the Space on Main, a co-working and makerspace in Bradford, Vermont. Matt Dunn is the founder and executive director of the Center on Rural Innovation based in Heartland, Vermont. And Sam Hooper is the owner of the Vermont Glove Company, which is based up in Randolph, Vermont. So welcome everyone. Great to have you all with us today. Thanks, Andrew. Great to be here. And thank you all for making the time for this discussion uh, as well. Um, in a moment, I'd like to invite uh, Matt and Monique and Sam to describe the work their organizations are doing with regard to entrepreneurship and rural innovation and workforce development and so forth. But first, John, I was wondering if you could perhaps get us started a little and uh, summarize what this proposition involves and, and perhaps a background or an overview of uh, how the Council on Rural Development developed these propositions. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. Really appreciate you hosting these conversations and the whole team at GNAT and uh, uh, Monique, Matt, and Sam. It's really great to have you as part of this conversation today as well. You know, uh, the Council on Rural Development is, we are a convener organization, a facilitator. We have hosted uh, well over 100 conversations in communities or, or processes in communities around the state of Vermont. And in that work, what we see is an opportunity and a need to develop more of a statewide vision for our future. Uh, the question that we frame, and this is with a nod to the Vermont Community Foundation that helped frame up this question is, what do Vermonters need to do in the next three year, years to be successful over the, over the next generation? And so what we've done over this spring and, uh, and last fall and winter is really talk to Vermonters. We've engaged 700 Vermonters in interviews, whether in a group setting or one-on-one. -on -one. We've uh, well over a thousand Vermonters have filled out surveys. We hosted recovery visits as part of, uh, as part of COVID response statewide in, in all 14 counties. And so the 10 propositions that make up sort of what we are talking about and proposing really come from Vermonters, from that perspective, from our deep public engagement in communities around the state of Vermont. And the purpose of this conversation is really to sort of think specifically about this question of, of economic development, entrepreneurship, how do we grow that ecosystem of small and medium and big businesses and business success here in Vermont. And um, honestly, I think I'll be mostly on the sideline. I'm really looking forward to listening in as, as, uh, as this team hashes about on, on the topic today. So thanks, Andrew. Really appreciate, uh, again, you, you hosting this conversation for us. 
Well, thank you, John. Uh, and uh, now I guess we'll invite our the rest of our panel here to tell us a little bit about their respective organizations. Uh, Matt Dunn, why don't we start with you? Uh, tell us a little about the Center on Rural Innovation. What is, what is what is your mission and game plan? Sure. So the Center on Rural Innovation is an action tank uh, that's focused on building digital economy jobs in rural places. Uh, nationally, uh, the, the uh, uh, Great Recession caused a divergence uh, in the economies of rural and urban places, uh, driven largely by automation, globalization, uh, and the decline of entrepreneurship in rural America that had been falling for the 30 years prior to the Great Recession. Uh, so without the farm team of new companies to come in when the recession hit, uh, and with the types of jobs that were being created uh, being ones that were being created in, in urban areas, uh, mostly the, uh, the, the products of automation, so uh, uh, robotics and computer software and the like, um, and those jobs that they were automating being removed in rural, you just had this massive divide. So uh, that by even the, the um, uh, January of 2020, before COVID, uh, not even half of rural counties in our country had gotten back to their pre-recession levels, whereas every urban place had gone uh, far beyond. So what we believe is necessary to be a part of uh, economic recovery is to have uh, digital economy jobs, uh, computer and automation and robotics jobs. Uh, and so, because right now, rural America represents 15% of the nation's workforce, but only 5% of the digital economy jobs. So our mission is to get that 5% up to 15% so that uh, all folks uh, in America have the chance for the jobs that can create uh, economic uh, growth for, for them, um, but are also resilient in the face of automation moving forward. Uh, we do capacity building work. So we work with communities uh, like Springfield and Randolph and others uh, to help uh, create uh, accelerator programs and uh, and pathways for people uh, who may be underemployed to get digital economy jobs. Uh, and we're doing that uh, all across the country uh, from uh, Heartland, Vermont. All right, uh, Monique, uh, you're next. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the space on Main. Uh, it's a co-working space up there in, in Bradford. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, so we uh, ended up taking over what was in a kind of a closed uh, department retail store that had been there since the 1950s. Um, and our uh, Main Street was pretty feeling pretty dead um, a couple years ago um, and just uh, tried to come up with creative solutions on ways to um, basically work to support people who are trying to make it here in, uh, in rural Vermont, but also to um, retain younger people who are, uh, you know, leaving the area uh, because they don't feel like they have uh, either like the community or the, um, say, like broadband resources to, to make it here. Um, so we start off as a co-working kind of conference and event space. Um, so we have community groups that come through. Um, We've had things like Senate hearings or uh, bands uh, come through and do live music shows um, to things like doing educational classes um, to kind of teach people how to engage in their uh, municipal government um, to things like uh, we did on, uh, before COVID, right, right as COVID was starting, we were doing um, entrepreneurship um, panels of people, of small businesses and entrepreneurs who had just started businesses or um, had successful businesses in the area, kind of um, teaching people you know, how they made it, um, the failures they had seen, um, and what other people could do to, to start their own ventures. Um, we ran uh, two business accelerators um, with, with 21 um, entrepreneurs through them. Um, and that's kind of our next, our next, what we're working on now is increasing the, the accelerator kind of portion um, and serving as a connector between like local financial institutions, um, business technical um, assistance um, businesses uh, and uh, things like chambers of commerce and things to support people who want to start businesses. Um, I also, I'm just going to give a plug for the other hat that I wear. So, uh, which is for the center for women and enterprise, um, which is, uh, basically provides technical assistance to women entrepreneurs, uh, in the state of Vermont, uh, and throughout New England, actually. All right, great. And, uh, Sam, uh, tell us a little bit about the Vermont Glo Glove Company. 
Yeah, so we were Vermont Glove, been here in Randolph since 1920. You can see behind me on the wall, there's some of the old gloves that we made back then, silk dress riding gloves. Uh, European market had a pretty good stronghold on that. We quickly transitioned to making utility gloves for the trade sector during the uh, Electrify America FDR program. And we've been making gloves for power line workers ever since. And I took over ownership of the business about three years ago, uh, formerly known as Green Mountain Glove. And we've been leveraging our position in the trade sector to be a consumer facing brand with meaningful values, creating good paying jobs here in Randolph and trying to you know, have a positive impact on our community and use our business as a platform to uh, speak out against the things uh, we believe in. Um, and been doing pretty well so far. So if you want to check out our gloves, Green Mountain Glo or VermontGlove.com, and uh, that'll be my plug for the day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I will have to check them out. Got a lot of yard work to do. Um, anyway, I thought uh, perhaps we could start by kind of uh, looking at this proposition and unpacking it a little bit here. Uh, it starts off talking about uh, entrepreneurship. And I guess I was just wondering if I could ask each of you to, you know, sort of talk a little bit about what you think is involved in the notion of entrepreneurship. Uh, are there some certain keys or certain critical elements that, uh, that lead to successful entrepreneurial activity? Uh, is there some sort of secret sauce that's out there that you know, can be replicated uh, across different, different kinds of businesses or in a different locations? And uh, uh, Matt, if you don't mind, I'll start off with you again, if I may, and just have you uh, uh, tell us what you think, uh, or what comes to mind when, when you think about entrepreneurial activity. Sure. So uh, Monique and I actually have something in common. We, we, we help entrepreneurs, uh, but we also uh, started our own enterprises. Um, and I, I think we come to this with, with both of those uh, views, which is, which is interesting. And, and Sam uh, reinvented a company, which is sometimes harder than starting something from scratch. Uh, and they're all sort of notions of that, of that uh, sense. I mean, a, an entrepreneur has to be, uh, you know, incredibly focused on solving uh, some kind of problem, right? There is, at the end of the day, it, it may be a, a market problem. It may be something that people really want, but isn't available in a local market. Uh, and, and then to be able to figure out all of the pieces that have to come around to, to be able to make that happen. And while we, we'd like to think that it all works the way that it, it uh, they tell you it does in, uh, in business school, um, where it happens in the exact order that you plan and when things want to happen, it, it, life just isn't like that. And in fact, you have to be really nimble and have a very open aperture uh, to know, all right, here is the opportunity over here. I know that was supposed to be step six, but if we can get that step six going now, then we can do three through five because otherwise it's it's not going to happen. Um, and your job as an entrepreneur is to, to, to really set that focus and then bring in other collaborators uh, to help you get to that place, whether they're working for you or they're working alongside you, they're funding you uh, to be able to go after it. You, you, you do have to be, and we were joking before the show, a, a little bit crazy, right? You, you do have to believe in your heart that this vision can come to a reality, uh, despite a lot of evidence to the contrary, uh, that you are... <laughs> Many times told over and over again that, that that seems like a really hard thing to pull off, uh, and you've got to be okay with going and asking, uh, you know, for a new customer or for a new funder or something like that, and be told no, and not have that be the end of the either that conversation or the fifty others that you have down the uh, down the line. So we see that uh, with our you know the the folks who are being accelerated through our uh, network of, of uh, ecosystem builders. Uh, and, and what I think is, is, is interesting and is in many places that have sort of, uh, that have not had that entrepreneurial spirit for a while, for a wide variety of reasons, it's sometimes hard to make them feel comfortable with that risk, to feel comfortable with knowing, all right, this may not work out the way that I'm playing, but I'm gonna take that leap and I'm gonna run at it. And when that has been lost from a, a culture, it, it's hard to get it back because it's much easier when you see other people making that leap 
to feel like you're comfortable making that leap as well. And, and so that's the final thing that I'll, I'll flag is how important it is to uh, do full systems change if you're trying to create more entrepreneurship. You need to be doing what Monique's doing, which is bringing entrepreneurs who have gone and done that crazy thing and been successful to tell their story and not to gloss it all over, uh, to have folks like Sam who's getting out there with his company and sharing the values that they're bringing as a company to say, just because you are, are running an enterprise doesn't mean you have to abandon your values. In fact, it can lift up uh, the values that you and the folks that work for you are wanting to bring out there. Um, and it's, uh, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a very um, hard thing to articulate, uh, but it just is so important that you work on that culture of risk taking, that sense that you can go out there and try it, uh, and that that grit, which I, I think we have in Vermont naturally, to just keep on after it until you figure out a way to make it work and fit. Okay. Um, well, before I move on, uh, Monique, Sam, did you wish to uh, comment in any way on, on that uh, as well, or build upon anything that Matt said? Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, so yes to everything I said, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and then just a, a few other just things like, uh, I mean, access to capital, which I think is something that we could really work on here in Vermont <laughs> um, and everywhere. Um, but that's definitely something. So actually being, so if somebody has an idea, um, giving them the resources and, and the, the money to actually be able to, to make that come to life, um, I think is the big thing that we all need to work on. <laughs> um, and, and then just also having, providing the spaces, like um, Matt was talking about ecosystem, um, uh, ecosystems for uh, the entrepreneurship. So providing spaces um, like uh, the Black River Innovation Campus and Vermont Center for Emerging Technologies and the Space on Main and um, just any number of organizations that are working to bring a number of people together, like Matt said, so people can see you know, what they're, what the other people are going through. So they have people who they can bounce, like, I'm really struggling with this thing, or I just had my first sale or, you know, celebrate success, successes, but also be able to talk through, um, you know, the hard things, the wall that they keep banging their head over against over and over and over again, um, and just providing some kind of support system for people um, and technical assistance. I think um, we have a lot of um, technical assistance uh, providers, uh, Center for Women and Enterprise, uh, the Small Business Development Centers, um, Mercy Connections, all kinds of uh, technical assistance. Um, but I think there's often a gap between those technical assistance providers that are often centered in um, kind of more populated areas uh, or, you know, or they're underfunded or they're understaffed. They might have like one person or two people who are supposed to be handling the whole state of Vermont. Um, or their whole county, um, and I think in a lot of ways we have a we have an opportunity to expand to network between those uh, organizations better, so that we're actually able to reach the people who are at the end of the the dirt road in the middle of nowhere, who actually has a brilliant idea, um, you know, working in their shop or the garage or something. Um, yeah, yeah, I would agree with all of that. Um, and just a couple of things, Matt, you nailed a couple of things there with, with grit for sure. I think that's the number one most important thing for a successful entrepreneur. Um, definitely agree with access to capital, but um, like we were talking about just a minute ago with, with Matt was saying, figuring out solving a problem or bringing a, something to market that is going to create progress or ha has, um, has opportunity and value. If you have a good idea and you have a well thought out business plan, um, you know, access to capital shouldn't discourage you, you know, and I agree with Monique that we, we need to make it more accessible, but um, you're going to be told no a million times and you're going to have to have the grit to, you know, pick yourself up. And there, I, the culture of entrepreneurship is, is important to make it seem as though if you do fail, you, you're going to be, you know, it's okay to fail once you're going to get back up. You're going to try again, you know? Um, and I think that the, the idea of failure is really daunting for young entrepreneurs. And of course, you know, I've been very privileged in my life having grown up in an entrepreneurial family and seeing what that looks like. And so I'm, I have the ability to think big and, and, and accept, accept risk and take on debt. And I, cause I'm not afraid of those things, but I agree fostering a, a a culture where 
it's okay to, you know, take these risks. Um, but the main thing I guess is like, be diligent about doing the things that aren't fun to do. You know, you have to be a Jack of any trades and you may not be the best at all of them. And I think one thing that one reason, you know, four out of five small businesses fail is because they get so focused on doing the things that they love but not focused on doing the things that really need to get done. And some, sometimes that's cash planning. Sometimes that's spending hours in front of a spreadsheet. Sometimes that's being the boots on the ground, um, sweeping the floor, you know? So you, just grit is definitely the number one thing I think you need to have. All right. Um, I guess I was wondering, uh, is there something in particular that strikes you that the state of Vermont could do to encourage more entrepreneurial activity around the state? Uh, I mean, is, is, it, is it a tax thing or regulations that, uh, you know, when you think about, gee, you know, it'd be great if more people took the initiative to kind of start their own business or follow up a, an idea or a dream, but, you know, then they're going to, it's going to take years before they see any positive results. I mean, uh, does anything in particular come to mind or, or, or is uh, the state's uh, occasional reputation as being like sort of less than as pro business as it could be not justified. Yeah, this, this one gets me going. Um, I, right. I love this, this concept <laughs> that uh, Vermont is unfriendly to business. I could, I fully disagree. Um, you know, you hear some business owners threatened to want to go to New Hampshire. I'm like, okay, great. Go. If you want to stop trading on the Vermont cache, if you want to stop trading on the Vermont name, go to New Hampshire. If you want to stop paying those taxes, you're going to pay them in property taxes. Um, no, no taxation program ever put a business out um, in Vermont uh, or in any state, for, for example, for that matter. Um, if, if you're letting that be the demise of your business, um, then there's a million, and other, a million and one other things that need to be corrected first. So uh, I think there are things that Vermont can do on the state level to inspire and open up more doors. But I, I, I it, by no means is the business community being choked out by the state of Vermont in terms of public policy. Matt, Monique, would you care to jump in on that one? Hey, look, uh, Sam, Sam said that in plainer uh, English than I ever would, but I, you know, I'm, I'm on the same, same place and particularly for entrepreneurship, right? Entrepreneurs are not worried about their marginal tax rate. They're worried about getting their idea to market or getting customers to be able to come into their space. They are focused really like a laser on getting that done. And, you know, maybe when it's hugely successful and everything else, they start to look at those kinds of things. Um, but, it, you know, that that's not, if we're trying to actually build from the ground up new companies that have a connection to Vermont to begin with, rather than what, you know, has been traditional economic development, which is going, we call it whale hunting, you know, going out and trying to harpoon some big corporation to show up with a corporate campus, which by the way, isn't shown to be a great use of, of dollars because if they were going to be willing to you know take the lowest bidder before they'll take the lowest bidder later so uh there is so much more power in actually building up the kinds of companies um that can be successful that are rooted here feeling okay if they have an exit right you know exits happen that's fine that's actually successful as long as you're creating the avenues for people to then who, who are you know Vermonters who started it to then reinvest and to be a part of that virtuous uh, that that virtuous capital cycle that can happen it's what Silicon Valley is you know was really known for and frankly we've seen it in Vermont you know where where people who have started businesses you know dealer.com being an example of it the founders of that went and took that money and started investing in some of the the only only early stage tech capital that was going out there, which was you know exciting to see. Um, so anyway, there's I think the, the things that uh, I think the state of Vermont uh, can do is is really follow the lead of the the Vermont Community Foundation uh, and the work that you know Dave Bradbury and and Monique have been uh, pioneering, which is to think about how do you create those uh, those those um, cultural shifts that we talked about before, um, but also nodes, uh, you know, places and spaces where people can come together to see someone else who's trying it, who can commiserate, who can share ideas, 
who can bring folks with capacity who want to invest in Vermont uh, over to actually understanding where there are companies that they can invest in and feel great about what, what they're investing in uh, and can actually bring their own expertise to come along with that, uh, with that investment. Um, so, you know, the, the, the kinds of things that uh, you know, Dan Smith and, and his team have been investing in recently has been helping to support those those vessels, uh, the things like uh, the Space on Main, you know, VSET, BRIC, other kinds of uh, entities being able to provide uh, higher risk um, uh, loans uh, that a bank wouldn't provide to either a startup uh, or to a um, or, or to an enterprise that's trying to redevelop a, a downtown space to make that happen, uh, and something that I don't think a lot of people know about is that the Vermont Community Foundation is leading the nation in actually taking some of their capital, some of their endowment money, and actually investing in Vermont companies. Because they said, if we're not if we're not doing that side of the ledger, we're not going to have the same impact. You have places like Mamava that have done incredibly well creating jobs both in, in Burlington and in Springfield, Vermont. Uh, and then, and, and I think the way that the state could get involved in that is by using resources like the significant amount of ARPA money uh, that has come down from the feds to invest in those kinds of long-term capacity supporting entities uh, to make sure that the jobs aren't just being created in, uh, you know, in, in frankly, you know, Burlington and, and Chittenden County and a, a little bit of Waterbury and, and, and Montpelier, but that it's actually distributed across the state so that we can have a healthy distributed economy all the way across. Final thing is that, uh, you know, the state a, a number of years ago uh, provided uh, some subsidy and backstops to encourage higher risk capital, uh, different from Vita, uh, but higher risk capital for a seed fund uh, in the state. And, and that really was valuable and could do a lot more. Um, that's happening in uh, other states uh, where they're not the only source of capital that's coming in, but they're able to create a piece of it that is comfortable with knowing that, you know, only one out of 10 of those companies are going to become a scalable company. Um, and that's okay. Um, and we can actually come into the uh, the investor community, provide some state uh, uh, benefit uh, for folks putting that kind of money into a pool that's a higher risk pool uh, to be able to allow for a you know Sam Hooper to to pivot an older company or the companies that are coming through Monique's space to be able to have access to that first fifty thousand dollars, that first seventy five thousand dollars that makes such a difference in in their ability to get from here to there. And Monique, before we move on to our next point, anything you wanted to add to uh, what the state might do or could, could help in some way uh, to promote and scale up more entrepreneurial activity around the state? Yeah, definitely. I'm going to throw salt on a wound a little bit for the state of Vermont, but um, as far as just um, speaking to a, a lack of diversity and um, in for both like women support for women and uh, BIPOC owners, uh, business owners and access to capital. So um, in the United States um, in 2016, um, less than 2% of venture capital went to women owned businesses and 1% went to African American and Latino businesses. And um, that's the United States, but I wouldn't be surprised if it is very uh, similar in the, in Vermont, if not kind of worse in Vermont. Um, and um, I just know uh, from for the Center for Women in Enterprise, um, we've just seen like women are uh, less likely to take on loans and debt. Um, they're also less likely to um, apply for money, thinking that there's somebody else out there that needs it more. Um, and I think just encouraging um, people to actually um, take advantage of the resources that are there by supporting them and also just being more strategic with the different, like Matt was saying, different ways that we can fund businesses rather than just the traditional bank loans, um, which often also comes with some kind of um, archaic uh, policies that <laughs> that don't that aren't equitable uh, for people. And thinking through like micro lending um, or like Matt was talking about the seed funding and just being a little bit more um, flexible uh, with how people get access to that money. Um, yeah. What Monique didn't mention was that women entrepreneurs are also much more successful than male entrepreneurs. Like all the data shows that women entrepreneurs are more successful. So it's it's particularly galling that the kind of statistics that Monique talks about uh, are the current situation. 
So, well, uh, let's turn next to uh, uh, the next part of this proposition uh, about workforce development. Uh, it's a subject we touched upon a couple of times in some of the, the previous shows in one way or another. Uh, and I guess I just sort of ask you all, uh, what are the challenges and opportunities here? I mean, this has been a subject that's been discussed uh, at great length over the past few years. Uh, you know, concerns about if we're training the right mix of workers for the future, uh, you know, uh, population growth, are there gonna be enough workers to take care of all the, the jobs that will be available? Uh, uh, so I guess I'll just go around the room again, if I may, and uh, perhaps Monique, I'll start with you uh, on this one. Uh, what, what do you see as the workforce challenges and opportunities that are facing the state in, in the coming years? Yeah, so as far as the, um, we see about 3,500 high school grads and 4,500 college grads who are retained by the state each year. Um, so it's about eight, just over almost 19,000 um, people. Um, oh, sorry, our demand is 19,000 people. Uh, so we have a gap of about 10,000 people per year um, as far as jobs. Um, and so we're not... Um, we're not doing things, uh, I think, in a lot of ways that we could be doing at an early age, um, which even when we do studies, I just recently did a strategic plan for our like local school district um, and things like um, getting kids interested in set technical um, and trade opportunities, as well as financial literacy in schools is was just at the super top <laughs> of everybody's priority, which is not something that's discussed often, uh, especially in like our small area. Um, but I think getting kids into the mindset of uh, what is entrepreneurship and how how does a, a business even get created? Um, what are skills that you can do um, that you don't have to go to a four year college for? Um, things like that. Um, that I think in a lot of ways, if we just kind of focused on uh, skill developments um, and not saying the four year <laughs> degree isn't valuable because it is. I <laughs> went through a master's myself um, and I definitely uh, appreciate that. Um, but I think that we need to just be uh, the stigma around technical and trade uh, is something that we really have to work on um, and encourage people um, because people can jump right out of high school, get um, uh, be an apprentice with an electrician or something and, and make really decent money like right off the bat um, and not take on a bunch of debt and have to feel like they have to leave the state of Vermont in order to, to make a living and uh, buy a house and support their family. And Sam, I imagine this is must be a question you think about a lot. Uh, finding uh, finding the right workers for your for your business is is that a problem or is it you know kind of you know an overrated problem? Uh, it's one hundred percent our Achilles heel. It's the thing that will prevent us from scalability. Um, it, we we're not having a sales and marketing issue. We're having a um, manufacturing capacity issue, and and that you know when. When I did my introduction, I forgot to mention that we we make every product that we sell right here in our factory. Uh, we cut and hand sew every unit. And sewing a leather glove is about the most intricate and challenging item to sew in the garment and textile industry. Um, so for us to be doing that here requires an immense amount of training and immense amount of skill. So it may take me three months to train a new sewer. Um, so you're tying up a lot of working capital and that's, you know, that's why cash is comes at a serious premium in our business. That's why we defer every payment that we can, um, to be paid at a later date. We save as much working capital as possible. So that's super important to us. Um, now this is a place where I think the state of Vermont can play a huge role in terms of workforce development, in terms of training schools. Um, there's about 25 growing um, sewing operations or textile operations in Vermont, whether you, most people don't realize that, but you, you know, you can rattle them off. Darn tough is, uh, you know, the big player in the space, um, a little bit more automation in their industry than, than in mine, but, uh, is still a, an extremely important sector to our economy here in Vermont and historically speaking was a massive part of our workforce. So for us to abandon it um, over the last few decades is kind has been somewhat frustrating for me. Um, and so I'm trying to get it back on the playing field um, by way of uh, VMAC of Vermont Manufacturing Extension Center along with uh, Chamber of Commerce and, and the state of Vermont. And I agree 100% with Monique about, we need to invigorate our tech programs again. We need to destigmatize those, you know, we were talking about 10,000 
trade jobs in not so far out here. I mean, I'm trying to up my electrical service right now just so I can bring in a new piece of equipment, but I can't up my electrical service because my electrician can't find another apprentice. So, the, I mean, it's, it, it is a real growing pain. Um, and, you know, in terms of people being saying, you're crazy for taking over Green Mountain Glove and, and thinking you're going to grow that business. How are you going to find the labor? And, you know, that's where my grit and a little bit of insanity comes in to, for me to want to do it. But, um, you know, another place is increasing the minimum wage in Vermont is a big thing. Um, you know, a lot of other business owners take the make the argument that if if the if the company down the street from us is paying 15 or the minimum wage is that at the gas station, then I got to pay X amount more. It's like, well, you're going to have to pay X amount more just to retain your employees in general. I mean, this stuff is happening. Like we're talking about an economy that's grown like this, like this, like this since 1980 and wages haven't kept up with it. The cost of living in Vermont is, you know, subsistence is around $30,000 a year. If you're not paying $15 an hour, your employee can't live here. So how long do you really plan on keeping them? So, you know, we, we start employees at 15 here. Um, yes. If the state, you know, we we're a big believer we need more people in the state of Vermont. So one good way to do that, to attract young people to come back to the state of Vermont is make it clear and cut, you know, as easy as they can see from, from afar out, they can say, I can move to Vermont and whatever job I get, I can pay to cover my cost of living right now. They can't say that. So they don't come. I'll, go, I'll, I'll let Matt, I'll let Matt take it from there. <laughs> All right. Actually, Matt, could I, uh, could I, inter- could I jump in? Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. So just going off what Sam said, just to throw a number at it, because the, the Vermont futures Pro, um, project just did a, like a series of focus groups with um, young professionals around the state of Vermont. Um, and what they came up with a number for like a cost of living for a family of three in Vermont is $5,555 a month. Um, and people make 500 or $5,480 per month, leaving them $75 to cover like healthcare, their phone, their, um, their in- internet bill, which is going to be required for anybody living here. Um, so it's just, it's not, it doesn't make sense. Like Sam said, as far as being able to actually afford living here right now, it's not. All right, Matt, over to you. Well, so I, you know, anyway, I, I wouldn't, I would want to be on this group uh, panel any day now. Cause I just think it's a, a group of folks who are, who are coming at this from, from slightly different places, but just uh, coalescing around a, a concept. We, we we do need more people in the state. Um, you know, some of us have been saying that for a while, and uh, and we can. Um, a lot of it's about making sure that there is investment in downtowns and in the kinds of uh, you know redevelopment that doesn't have to compromise the magnificence of Vermont. Um, but people are, are super fired up to to come back if they knew they had a job that could pay and be aspirational, as Sam said, uh, and that they could live in one of our cool downtowns, right? Have a sweet apartment in downtown Randolph or, or, or downtown Springfield. And so in some ways, the housing discussion in the state right now is all about addressing the, the uh, you know, low-income housing and homelessness, and it has to happen. But that doesn't mean we can't you know, chew gum and walk at the same time and provide the resources to invest in our downtown for folks who are, you know, early professionals or coming back or whatever um, to be a part of a growing state uh, and not just trying to shoehorn more people into, uh, you know, into Burlington, right? To actually do it across the state. There's so much capacity to create that vibrancy. Um, And it also will allow for people to feel a little bit uh, you know, less less risky in taking on perhaps that uh, entrepreneurial thing. Uh, and you know, I, it's and I want I'm going to talk about two things real quick. One is student debt is a brutal, brutal impediment for people being entrepreneurs. Right? If you've got student debt hanging over your head, uh, you are going to have uh, you know <laughs> a lot harder time to go and start something on your own, right? That's just, that's the bottom line. So whatever we can do to reduce student debt uh, in our state will allow more Vermonters to to choose to, you know, whether they went to school in Vermont or they went out but want to come back to be able to unlock their full creative potential to go and start something and do something or join, join a company that may or may not work out. But if you've got the student debt, it's going to make it tough. 
Uh, the other thing I want to just talk about is is the different kind of entrepreneurs that are out there. We're we're you know investing in a in a company that's not in Vermont, but it's uh, we have a seed fund uh, at the Center on Rural Innovation to 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 uh, invest in early stage companies uh, that are technology based and can scale you know nationally or globally. And this one company called Shift Auto. Uh, was someone who you know trained as a mechanic and worked in the uh, in the mechan- in the um, auto uh, repair business for a while and said the whole system for scheduling someone to get their far- car fixed is dumb. It is the stupidest thing he's ever seen. And w- partnered up with a technologist and and they built a platform to solve it for their one you know garage operation. And they said, wait a minute. They could all probably use this, and maybe that's an interesting idea. And they've turned that into a company uh, to go and and take the pain and suffering out of scheduling and figuring out your ride and everything else. And there's a lot of upside to touching customers at that early stage when you're making it easier for them. So the pathway for entrepreneurs can come from all kinds of places. It doesn't have to be a, you know, a, a, fancy degree uh, that gets you there, even in something that's that's technology-based. It's it's absolutely true for people who can be their own boss and uh, run a small company and do very well in the trades. But some for some folks in those trades, that can also translate into something in the in the technology realm and solve it a lot better than someone who's just thinking about it theoretically because, because they've gone and done it. And uh, I just want to flag that as so people are thinking about entrepreneurship, even technology entrepreneurship, um, know that that's an option. Final thing, Andrew, I'll just say is that Eve, for, for everyone going into the workforce, it doesn't matter where they're working, having some level of knowledge of computer science and technology is really critical. That doesn't mean everyone's going to go off and be a software designer or anything else, but as systems get more automated, whether it's on the shop floor uh, or it's the the folks at Design Book who are creating you know new new kinds of aircraft that can uh, in Burlington that can take off vertically and then fly to, to Burlington, knowing that uh, those basics of tech of technology and coding, so you know what's happening inside. It's just you know when my my dad insisted that I learn how a, an engine worked, right? It wasn't because he had any faith that I could become a mechanic, and that's true. You don't want me fixing any of your your uh, cars, but just having that general understanding of how that works helped in all kinds of other things, and it's it's the basics now. Uh, and the state of Vermont can do a lot more to make sure that that's, uh, you know, in every curriculum that every child is uh, is getting. All right. Well, while the Andrew, I wonder oh, if I could just chime in quick to sure. dovetail something, you know, I think the housing piece that Matt brought up is really fundamental, and it's so much been sort of exacerbated by some of the dynamics we've seen in the pandemic. And and it's just, I just wanted to sort of accent that because it's something we're hearing. I think most people think that's more of a sort of Vermont urban problem, but it's an everywhere problem right now. We're hearing from folks in the kingdom, recruiting people, getting people ready to take jobs in good middle-class sort of positions. And they just cannot accept the job because they cannot find the habitable, comfortable housing at an affordable price for them. And so just want to sort of highlight, and and the irony of that is that that's going to be a workforce issue as well, because we need to build a bunch of new housing. And boy, we need those people with the skills who can do that work as well. We're ready to make some investments there, but boy, we really need those folks coming out of the trades uh, and able to do that kind of work. If I put a point on John, you know, we're now 40 people in our organization. So it's a good size organization. I have three people trying to move to Vermont and can't find a house. I mean, it it is now we've all wanted everyone to discover Vermont and, and be excited about coming up, but we've got to keep up with it on the housing side so that we can uh, welcome people, uh, welcome people uh, who are more diverse than we have been traditionally. Uh, welcome people who want to be a part of you know what we've made so special, um, but we 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 can't just sit back and and hope it'll happen. Yeah, I can second that. We're a team of eleven, and we've already invested in, in employee housing. Mm-hmm. Child care is another one that seems to come up a lot uh, as well. Well, we could we could bat around this one for a, um, I'm sure a while longer, but I, in the time we have left, I just wanted to kind of. Uh, 
move on to kind of the last part of this uh, proposition uh, and uh, look at uh, business innovation in rural areas. And I realize most of Vermont probably qualifies as being rural, except for a few parts of Chittenden County or whatever. But um, I guess, do any of you think that there's any special uh, difficulty or magic or way to go about bringing uh, business innovation to uh, the rural parts of the state? Um, and Matt, I know this is a subject you've, you've thought about greatly, uh, the digital aspect of uh, bringing digital jobs to small towns and villages, uh, you know, in, in various parts of the state. I, I just wondered, is, have, you, uh, have you developed any thoughts about you know, how, how the approach should be to, to bring more uh, development to the smaller communities in the state? Well, I, I think the big, and this may sound strange, we do a lot of programming, we've got the seed fund and all that the end of the day, I feel like so much of it is narrative. So much of the both the national narrative and sometimes in some of our smaller towns, uh, you know, and that that you, you're like, oh, well, that sounds like a Burlington thing or that sounds like a, you know, Boston thing, Matt, when you're talking about a, you know, a health tech company starting up. Well, it's not. It's not at all. And and this is not this has not been traditional. I mean, Vermont has been an entrepreneurship and an innovation state for a long time. You know, some of the first engines in the country that were invented were invented in Vermont. Uh, and, you know, it was sometimes people who were on the farm who just had to, you know, fix stuff. And then they were like, huh, that worked a lot better. Maybe we can turn it into a washing machine or whatever else. But it it is a, it, it's a, um, that, that narrative shift is just so important to know that you don't have to move to Burlington or to Kendall Square, Massachusetts to unlock this idea and be able to be successful for with it. Uh, and in places like Springfield, that was the heart of innovation, right? It was the, the it was on Hitler's bomb list because the you know intellectual property coming out of the machine tool there was so important uh, that it was seen as a threat uh, to to the axis. So we've got. Uh, we, we've just got to get back to those roots where we know that every corner of Vermont has people who are ready to unlock that potential. Uh, and, you know, that's what Monique does every day is trying to shift that narrative. Sam's, Sam's doing it by like <laughs> creating a business that's going to compete in the global marketplace. But uh, I, I just think that's, uh, that's such an important piece to show that it is, it is possible, it is here. Um, and and then create the the structures to to unlock it. All right, Monique, uh, would you like to build on that? Yeah, I totally agree with Matt. <laughs> um, I think it's time uh, that we stop talking about all the things that we're lacking and we're not doing the things that we could do if we spent some time on them, <laughs> like broadband and housing and childcare and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think going back to the very first things that we we're saying, um, Vermonters just kind of inherently have an aspect of uh, like an amount of grit to them um, and they're innovative because they have to be because in order to make it here. <laughs> so I think just kind of embracing that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Agree. And Sam, uh, uh, any particular ch special challenges to uh, bringing economic activity to rural parts of our state? I think rural parts of the state are in a great position right now to um, spring load off of this uh, pandemic. Um, people want it, want to live in the country and, and as long as they have the access to be able to continue to um, execute their career or whatever it may be, then, then we can enable that to happen. A couple big, big things to focus on are public education um, and just continuing to invest in our teacher workforce, um, child care, universal child care for, you know, we offer flexible scheduling in our business because it's one way we can have a key, a couple of our key employees who have young children at home work with us. So, you know, there's those handful and, you know, broadband that's coming, like we got to make that happen. That's the reason, um, you know, big government matters. You know, if there wasn't FDR's program for electrify America, if there wasn't this broadband bill to bring, uh, bring high-speed internet to that last dirt road, you just wouldn't have these things. So those are important pieces of the puzzle. And then there's the recreation piece. Um, we're in a really good position to leverage Vermont's landscape in a responsible way, not in a degraded, degraded way, but in a responsible way to leverage the assets that we have all around us, especially in a changing agricultural market. So I, I, I'm excited for Vermont. And we got a lot of doers here. 
to add on to Sam, I also think one thing that didn't come up this whole time was um, the creative economy. Um, and I think Vermonters, we we have a much higher percentage, we're almost 10% um, of our economy is actually from the creative network. Um, and I think that uh, just once we, um, I think a lot of us uh, know that and value it, but I think if we can do as much as we can to support artists, um, especially since they're usually the ones like in the middle of the backwoods, off on their own, like doing their thing in their studio, um, trying to get those uh, people engaged in the community and engaged with other on with entrepreneurs um, in order to come up with creative solutions. So uh, we uh, have time for one last question here and, and uh... I'm going to sort of try and hold each of you to about a minute or so for your answers because uh, I want to get everyone an equal time here. But I, I guess I couldn't help but wonder as I was listening to what you all talk, uh, what you saw as the uh, effect of the pandemic on all of this stuff as we go forward into 2021 and 22 and so forth. Uh, are there any uh, major like lessons learned that you're taking away from uh, the experience we've all uh, been through over the past 13 or 14 months and saying, well, going forward, this has to be different in order to build more rural innovation or more, more workforce development. Uh, I mean, supply chains would be one thing that would come to my mind, but each of you probably have a different slant on that. So uh, Monique, I'll let you start with this one since uh, my laptop's camera is right on you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think uh, for me, it's been um, I, right when the pandemic started to happen, um, Vermont Council Rural Development stood up this effort to basically support um, communities uh, and community leaders who are trying to like figure out what to do what emergency systems were needed, how to get food to people, um, you know, how to support people in their homes. Um, and I think that's just uh, like Sam was saying, at, to a certain extent, like big government is needed. And I think in a lot of ways this year showed me that um, there are lots of people who don't feel like they can get engaged politically and even in municipal governments. Um, but that relationship like has to exist <laughs> um, in order for us to actually um, be able to do things like housing and childcare and broadband. Um, and I think in ways that as much as we can um, kind of uh, create connections for just the average person to feel like they actually have some agency over the town that they live in, um, whether they're somebody who's been here for seven generations or they're somebody who just barely moved here um, and they want to get involved and they want to, um, you know, they have a passion for uh, their town actually thriving. Um, I think that we just need to, to do a better job actually feeling like everybody's part of a, a bigger thing um, in order to move Vermont forward. All right, Sam, we'll, you, we'll go to you next. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm glad you brought up the supply chain piece, you know, investing in a more secure supply chain and, and not being so dependent on uh, other places in the world. It would be very, very strategic, um, you know, just in hindsight with this pandemic. With that said, vertically integrated manufacturing and businesses for your employees, and as well as, um, you know, being able to make a pivot, like the state of Vermont needed a lot of face masks about this time last year. So we re-dyed and tooled and we made 56,000 face masks. So that's the power of vertically integrated businesses. Um, and then the last thing I guess is community really matters. Um, the people who create our, our communities um, definitely make life a lot better for everybody. So, um, you know, just kind of making sure we don't take that for granted, I think in the future is important. And Matt, I guess you get the last word on this one. Yeah, well, uh, you know, if nothing else, the pandemic uh, showed us that broadband's important right? It's not just a, a luxury. It's, you know, as, as Sam was referencing, it's the, you know, electricity of our time. Uh, and hopefully the momentum that's come with that will allow us to solve this and not to solve it for the short term with short term fixes, but with long term fiber to the home fixes uh, across the whole state. Uh, the, the other part is that, you know, I share Sam's optimism, right? There is an, a, a new view about where people can work, and where people can start companies that solve big problems. And that, I, I don't know how long that's going to last. It's here right now, uh, where investors and, uh, and, and um, people who are, uh, who are looking to, to, to move their job someplace or hire someplace, uh, someone someplace else are actually thinking about it differently. They're not you know, caught in everyone's got to be in you know, 25 zip codes right, in order to be investable or, or to be hireable. And so we have, a, we have a, a window of opportunity to really seize that. 
and to say, yes, and we have companies that are trying to get started and we have people who want to be here and or people who are here who are talented, who can uh, solve problems and work with teams collaboratively across the board. You've got to have that broadband infrastructure for that to become real. Um, but because Vermont was actually ahead of the curve in doing that in really creative kinds of ways, we're better positioned. We're also better positioned to use the, you know, the ARPA money to actually solve this problem. Um, but we've just got to go and do it and, and be really, really uh, in some ways loud about it. But we're, we are here. We're ready to be at the front uh, edge. Uh, the, the pandemic has been awful on a variety of levels and the people who've been on the front lines, you know, thank God and hats off and back to Sam's comment about community because those are the folks who got us through uh, the, the bad part of it. But the positive sides are, are real, particularly for a state like Vermont. Uh, and uh, it's just up to us now to seize that moment. All right. Well, um, boy, we could talk for another hour about this. I got a funny feeling, but uh, just about out of time. But we do have time, uh, John uh, Cobans, for you to tell us a little bit about the uh, summit meeting that the Vermont Council on Rural Development has planned for, uh, uh, I believe it's May 26th and 27th. What's going to be going on? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And also just want to quickly thank Monique and Matt and Sam for this, uh, this awesome conversation. You know, the cool thing about working at the Council on Rural Development is on one hand, we have the audacity to convene a summit called the Summit on the Future of Vermont, right? A really big title to this. But I think we also understand and have the wisdom that it is Vermonters that have the answer to that question about what the future of Vermont holds. And so our mission is to really build that crowd, those participants uh, for this summit. It's May 26th and May 27th. Uh, Futureofvermont.org is a place to go to learn about this Vermont proposition and the summit. No cost uh, to participate if, um, uh, or you're welcome to make a contribution as well. You know, we this conversation to me highlights so well like the, ecosystem of, you know, you can't talk about entrepreneurship without talking about childcare, without talking about housing, without talking about workforce. It all connects. And uh, we're really looking forward to this conversation at the end of the month as we think more with Vermonters about what are the action steps to realize uh, this vision for our uh, state. So registration is, uh, is, is open for the summit. They can go to that website and... Uh... That's Click right. On. Registration's open now. You got it. All right. Well, thank you, John. And thanks to all of uh, the rest of our panelists as well. Uh, Monique Priestley, uh, Sam Cooper, and Matt Dunn. Really appreciate all of you making the time today for this conversation uh, on this uh, seventh proposition. Uh, and uh, next week, we'll be talking about uh, the eighth proposition, which is that uh, Vermont must reform regional coordination and governance and advance efficiency and foresight in state planning. That sounds like that should be interesting. We'll certainly look forward to that one. Anyway, thanks again uh, to everyone. Thanks to all of you who've been uh, watching. I uh, hope you found the program interesting, and we'll see you again next week. Meanwhile, have a great day.